You are listening to KZT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. In today's Bible, July 3rd, 2022, I'll be reading the narration of the broadcast through Facebook and YouTube channel. Today's mystery passage, Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, and Luke chapter 11, verse 1 through 2. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. Pray like this, our Father in heaven. May your name be kept holy. Luke chapter 11, verse 1 through 2. Once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said, This is how you should pray. Father, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. You are listening to KZT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. In today's Bible, July 3rd, 2022, I'll be reading the narration of the broadcast through Facebook. There is a daily death that occurs to sin, and there is a daily life that is to be lived to God. So you must live like you are alive in Christ. This morning, we are in Romans chapter 6, verse 11 through 14. Romans 6, verse 11 through 14. A bit of a recap here, and then I'll tell you what the sermon is all about. The way that the book of Romans is structured up to this point is simply this. Romans 1 through the first half of chapter 3, Paul discusses the condemnation of sinners. And then he makes a bit of a transition, whereas all sinners are condemned by their own sin, by their association there with Adam, we're all condemned and guilty before God. The second half of chapter 3 all the way through chapter 5 is about not the condemnation of sinners, but the justification of sinners. How a sinner is made right with God. And we know that we're not made right with God by the things that we do. We can't achieve righteousness, but we can receive righteousness. We receive righteousness as a gift from God through grace given to us by faith. When we believe in the Lord, just as he counted it to, to Abraham, God counts our faith towards us as righteousness. And thereby, he views us in two ways. He views, he views us as acquitted of the guilt of all of our sins, and he views us as having the righteousness of Christ. So he removes our guilt, and he imputes upon us the righteousness of Jesus, all of the good things, all the right things, and the ways that Christ obeyed the Lord in his earthly life. Now, in chapter 6, and really chapter 6 through chapter 8, Paul talks about the sanctification of sinners. So he moves from condemnation to justification or salvation, and now he's talking about sanctification, or literally, your holy making. Being made more like Jesus. Being made holy as he is holy. The endeavor of chapter 6, Paul's endeavor that is, is to show you that there is an inextricable, there is an indivisible link between your justification and your sanctification. In other words, what I'm saying is this. Paul shows you that justification is not just something that God does for you. It is something that God actually does in you. He actually changes who you are. Yes, he sets you free from the guilt of sin. He, he acquits you of that guilt. That's something he does for you. 
but he also sets you free from the power of sin. That's something he does within you. That's what it means for him to justify you. He sets you free from guilt and he sets you free from the power of sin. So what he's done here at the first half of chapter 6, verses 1 through 10, is he's explained to you what exactly it means to be in Christ. You remember there in verse 4, to be in Christ means that you have died to sin. Just as Christ was buried and dead for your sins, so also as you are unified with Christ by the faith that moves you to be baptized, you also are saying, I am dead to sin. And you are literally dead to sin. Not only are you dead to sin in Christ, but in Christ you now live a brand new life. Just as Jesus was raised from the dead to live everlastingly for the Father, for his glory, so also when you are unified with Christ by faith, you live a brand new life. That's what you have in him. You're dead to sin. You have new life in Christ. And then ultimately in verse 5 through 7 of chapter 6, you are free from the power of sin. You are free from the power of sin. So those are the things that you are in Christ. You're dead to sin, you're alive to him, and you have power over sin. Now, in verses 11 through 14, you see a bit of a transition. Paul moves from verse 1 through 10. He's talking about all of the indicatives. Statements that are in the indicative tell you what you are. Now, he moves in verse 11 through 14 to imperatives. He moves to commands. He's no longer telling you what you are. Now he's telling you what you must do because of who you are. So verses 1 through 10 talk about what it means to be in Christ. Verse 11 through 14 talk about this, how to live alive in Christ. How to live alive in Christ. So because of all of these theological truths that you've grasped through these weeks of walking through every verse in the book of Romans up to this point. Now, how does the rubber hit the road? What, what are you supposed to be doing? What is your life supposed to be looking like? That's what Paul answers here in verse 11 through 14. How to live a life in Christ. If I could summarize the sermon in a single sentence, I'll say it like this. So grab your pens and write this with me. You, or you could even say I... You must live like you are alive in Christ. Now that seems like a strange bit of a statement, doesn't it? You must live like you are alive in Christ. Now we might say, well, I am alive in Christ. And Paul would say, great and wonderful, praise God. It's wonderful that you are alive in Christ. But you also must live like that. And the living like that is a daily thing. There is a daily death that occurs to sin and there's a daily life that is to be lived to God. So you must live like you are alive in Christ. What I'm going to show you from this passage is three commands, three things that Paul says God expects from us, three commands that you must fulfill as one who has been made alive in Christ. And you'll see them just from each one of these verses, verse 11, 12, and 13. And then in verse 14, Paul is going to lay down for you the foundation upon which your ability to fulfill these commands is built. So let's look at, at verse 11. You'll see this first command, the first thing that God expects from you. And back up to verse 10 and let's read that along with it. Paul says, for the death he, Jesus, died to sin... He died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So this is what Jesus did. Jesus died for our sins, to our sins, and he did it one time. And after that death, he was raised from the dead to live to the glory of God the Father. So what does Paul say? Paul says, so you also. So you're unified with Christ, your life must then be parallel to Christ. So you also, you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You must consider yourself. That word for consider is the same word that Paul used in Romans 4, 
to talk about how God reckoned Abraham as righteous. He considered Abraham as righteous. In other words, he accounted Abraham's faith to him as righteousness. You could even say it like this. From that point of Abraham's belief, God believed Abraham to be righteous. That's what God thought of Abraham. You are righteous in my sight. You are as good as sinless in my sight. So what does Paul say now that we have been reckoned as righteous in the sight of God? What does Paul say we must do? Well, if God believes that about us, we must believe that about us. Let's not miss this point because there's something that we tend to believe that is only a, a part of the gospel. If God believes us to be dead to sin and alive to him, what must we do? We must believe that we are dead to sin and alive to him. Write down this first command, and then I'll explain it to you just a bit, what it means to live alive in Christ. Number one, you must regard yourself as dead to sin and alive to God. You must regard yourself as dead to sin and alive to God. You have to understand, this is my identity. This is what I am. If I am truly united with Christ, I truly am dead to sin and alive to God. Now, what we tend to reduce the good news of Jesus to is simply this. In Christ, I am regarded as forgiven. In Christ, I am regarded as having one who has eternal life. And that's what we reduce most often. That's what we reduce our salvation to. I'm forgiven of my sins and I have eternal life. Paul says that's part of the good news. What you must do if you are alive in Christ is not only realize that you're forgiven of your sins and that you have eternal life, but you must actually regard yourself right now, here in this moment and every moment thereafter, you must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. That's no longer who I am. And I have to remind myself. Now, this is not the power of positive thinking. You're not going to think yourself into holiness. You just need to understand the reality of who God's made you. God has made you to be dead to sin, and he has made you to be alive to God. Listen to how Paul says it elsewhere. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 4. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above. This must be your life. Where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for, this is why you do this, for you have died, your old self, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Paul's saying that's the future expectation, is that you are going to appear with God in glory. The present expectation is based on the future expectation. The future expectation is to live with him in glory. And Paul says, live that way presently. Consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Set your mind on things that are above. Know that that's what God has done in you. He has not merely just forgiven you of your sins. He has not only just given you everlasting life. He has actually fundamentally changed who you are. Friends, we, we ought not be playing the victim Say, so, well, sin, sin is still, sin is still very much a part of me. Well, it shouldn't be. That's something that we have to regard ourselves as dead to. God has given you the victory over the sin that has been present in your life from before the time that you came to Christ. God has given you that victory, and you have to believe that, and you have to understand that. If you don't believe that, guess what happens? You just give up the fight before it's ever been fought. You just, you just give in. You say, well, sin's coming and I'm just going to do it. I just, I just can't control my mouth. I just can't control the things that I say about other people. Well, that's just me. Well, if that's just you, then you are not regenerate. 
If, if that is just you living in unholiness, living in ungodliness, then what you are saying is that God has never changed my heart. And if God hasn't changed your heart, he hasn't justified you. Because if he justifies you, he sets you free from the penalty of sin and he also sets you free from the power of sin. So if he has done that, then you must now consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Now look at what he says in verse 12. Another command. He says, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Let not sin therefore reign let it be king. Let it lord over you. Let it master you. Command number two. Not only does God expect us to regard ourselves as dead to sin and alive to God, but you must refuse. You must refuse to let sin rule over you. You must refuse to let sin rule over you. Let not sin therefore reign. What that tells me is that I actually do have the ability to allow sin to reign over me. God has set me free from the power of sin. But if I choose it to be so, I can be ruled and mastered by sin. But I also have the ability to dethrone sin in my life. In other words, if sin rules over you, it's not because it is your Lord. It is because you are subjecting yourself to it. It is because you are subjecting yourself to it. In other words, if you're in Christ, sin is only your master if you elect it to the position. Sin is only your master if you elect it to the position. You see, in America, we have a, we have a different understanding about government than, than many people in the world. Many people in the world, they're born into countries where there is a dictator. And that dictator was, was brought into power by force. They were able to kill more people than the other people. For some reason, they were stronger than the other people. And so they forced their way into power. And how long is that dictator going to rule? As long as that dictator is alive. And Paul is saying this, that sin was dictator in your life. And what Christ did when he came is he came and he dethroned that dictator for you. And he didn't do it by force. He actually did it by a voluntary death. He died and fulfilled the satisfaction to dethrone that ruler over you. And because you have been united with Christ, that dictator's sin does not rule over you anymore. But the sad fact is, we move from tyranny to democracy. Whereas Christ is supposed to be Lord over your life, you sometimes and I sometimes, we cast our vote for the other candidate. And we say, sin, it's okay for you to rule over me. I, I kind of miss the way that things used to be. Isn't that the same kind of attitude that the Israelites had when they were delivered out of Egypt? You remember what they said as they're going through the wilderness and they're approaching the promised land and they come through difficulty. They're receiving manna from heaven. They're receiving water from the rock. God is providing quail for them on a daily basis. And you remember how they moan and complain and they say, oh, how we long to be back in Egypt and have the, the vegetables that they had in Egypt and the food that they had in Egypt. We just, we just miss those days. And they want to go back into bondage when they were slaves. Whereas before them is the promised land. God has gone before them. He's saying, I'll be there with you. You don't have to be stronger than anybody because the Lord your God fights for you with an outstretched arm. He'll conquer all of your enemies. And the only reason that the Israelites were prohibited from entering into the promised land was because of their unbelief. Because they refused to regard themselves as the children of God, the God who would fight for them. You must regard yourself as dead to sin and alive to God. You must refuse to let sin rule over you. You don't have to elect sin to be your master. If sin rules over you, it's because you put it in that position. It's because we put it in that position.
So many battles are lost simply because we just don't show up to fight. Simply because we just say, well, today I just don't feel like it. Today I feel tired. I feel worn out. I just, I just don't feel like fighting anymore. So guess what? Sin's always going to show up to fight. But if we don't show up to fight, it's going to rule over us. But what does Paul say we must do? I got to consider myself dead to sin. Every day when I wake up, this is something that I have to do. Sin, you will not rule over me. I believe and know what God has done in me. And today I will walk in holiness. You must regard yourself as dead to sin and you must refuse to let sin rule over you. Now look at how he characterizes sin here in verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign, master you, be king over you, lord over you. In your mortal body, in your mortal body, he's talking about your physical body. Our physical bodies are the source of our appetites. And if you think correctly about sin, sin comes as the fulfillment of our appetites. Literally, it comes as the fulfillment of our disordered appetites, our disordered desires. And that's the word that he uses there at the end of the verse to make you obey its passions. The word there for passions is epithumia, the desires of the flesh or disordered desires, cravings. So what Paul is talking about here is don't let sin manipulate your appetites and then rule over you. Don't let sin rule your appetite for food. Don't let sin rule your appetite for love. You know what happens when sin rules our appetite for food and for the comfort we get through food? Well, we know the outcomes of that. What happens when sin rules our appetite for love? When sin rules our appetite for love, we end up doing things for people that we should not do because we want their approval. We live for the approval of man rather than the approval of God. And you can go on and on about the different appetites that our bodies might have, the different desires that we might have that sin will disorder and then use to rule over us. And Paul says, don't let that happen. Don't let it make you obey its passions. I like the way that John stated it in 1 John chapter 2. You remember this very well from about a year ago. 1 John 2 verse 16. He says, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the things that your body wants to feel, and the desires of the eyes, the things that look real good to you, and the pride of life, or literally the pride in possessions, those first two uh, disordered desires are for the things that you want, the things that you see. And then the pride of life or the pride of possessions is the sin that comes when you are prideful about the things that you have. See, you can, you can have disordered desires for the things you want and you can have disordered desires for the things that you already have. And he says, these are the things not from the Father, but they are from the world. Paul says, don't do that. Don't subject yourself to that kind of mastery. Now, look at verse 13. Not only do you regard yourself as dead to sin, alive to God, you also refuse to let yourself be ruled by sin. Now look at verse 13. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but... Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. That's the third of three imperatives, three commands that Paul has given us. Consider yourself dead to sin, alive to God. Refuse to allow sin to rule over you. Command number three, you must resolve to surrender your body and mind in obedience to God. You must resolve to surrender your mind and your body in obedience to God. Look at how he says it. Do not present. That word present is the word yield. Just don't, don't hand it over. Don't, don't give yourself over to sin or to unrighteousness as instruments. That word for instruments, some commentators believe that has the connotation of weapons. 
So don't use your body, don't use your faculties as weapons to achieve ungodliness, to achieve unrighteousness. What does Paul mean when he says, do not present your members? What is he saying when he says members? What are the members of our mortal body? Well, he's talking about all the aspects of our person. You know, it is possible for us to yield our eyes for unrighteousness, to to actually not control our eyes and what we look at and say, well, it's okay to to gaze at at this stuff again. Or, Or we yield our mouth to unrighteousness. And it's okay for me to use my mouth to cut down as a weapon, to use my mouth to cut down a brother or a sister purchased by the blood of God. It's possible for me to use my ears, to submit my ears to be used for sin. I do that simply by where I turn the dial on the radio. But sometimes I just need to turn the radio off or maybe you listen to podcasts or something like that. It is possible to subject, to yield your ears to ungodliness. And then you have unrighteousness just pouring into your heart. And guess what? When it pours out of your heart or into your heart from your eyes and from your ears, guess what comes out? What comes out of your mouth is destruction. What happens with your hands is you use them to accomplish evil. You use your legs to carry you to places you should not go. And you know what else he's talking about? He's not just talking about our eyes and our ears and our mouth and our hands and our feet. He is also talking about our sexual organs. And he's saying, do not yield them to unrighteousness. The body that God gave you is not meant for ungodliness, for unbridled passions, for disordered desires. But what does he say on the other hand? But... Look at that, verse 12. Right there in the middle of it, you have that word but. I've told you this before. You essentially have two ways in the Greek language of saying, of transitioning to draw contrast. The first way that you transition to draw contrast is you say day. It's just a coordinating conjunction and you're just, you're just showing a bit of contrast between the first and the second clause. But the second way that you do this in Greek is not the word day, it's the word Allah. And the word Allah is the the stronger adversative particle. It is actually meant to draw emphatic contrast between what was and what is. So rather than subjecting the members of your body, your mind, your hands, your mouth, and so on, rather than subjecting the members of your body to unrighteousness, but what did he say? Present yourselves, yield Surrender yourselves to God. That means every day when you wake up, there needs to be a moment where you say, God, I surrender myself to you. My hands, my feet, my eyes, my mind, my body. I surrender myself to you today. All of me, Lord, use me. But present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Know who you are. Know who God's made you to be. And present yourself to God as such. Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And your members to God as instruments, tools, weapons for righteousness. So those, those same body parts, the same aspects, the body and the mental faculties that sin would choose to manipulate and use for ungodliness, Paul says, don't let sin rule over you. You wake up and in every waking moment, you yield those faculties, those abilities and the parts of your body, you yield them to God as weapons, as tools for righteousness. You know what that tells me? That tells me God wants to accomplish good things through me. God wants to use me in order to do his work. God wants to use me in order to speak a word of kindness to somebody who is hurting. You know, sometimes we pray, Lord, would you give them peace? Lord, would you comfort them? How do you think God's going to answer that prayer? 
Sure, God can answer that prayer by sending his Holy Spirit and giving them a supernatural comfort, a supernatural peace. But you know what? I don't think that's the only way that God accomplishes that prayer. I think that God answers that prayer by sending us to speak that word of kindness. I think that God uses us. I was explaining to my wife the other night, Wednesday night, we went home. We were kind of, you know, debriefing about the evening and how the service went and everything. And, and I told her, I said, something interesting happened at the end of the service. And I, I, I said, I, I felt God just put a bridle on my mouth and guard me from making a sarcastic comment. We had a young lady who came to the church and she had brought her sister she wouldn't mind me saying this, but she had brought her sister. And it was the first time that her sister had come to church. And she comes up on the stage afterward. And we're all just kind of talking amongst one another. And, and, and I felt sin tempt me to use my mouth and to use my wit in order to, to use it for unrighteousness. And, and, and when she came up with her sister and she said, I'd like to introduce you to my sister. It's a proud moment for her. I'd like to introduce you to my sister. She says, this is, this is my pastor. This is Pastor Jordan. And it almost came out of my mouth. Yeah, we, we're so glad to have you here. We put up with your sister. I thought, well, that's, that's kind of funny. That's kind of sarcastic. And that's something that I used to probably would say. But I felt the Lord put a bridle on my tongue. And whereas sin was going to rule over me and use my mouth for unrighteousness, and I was going to think it was funny, God bridled my tongue, and instead I said, you know what, we're glad to have you here. Your sister is incredible. We love your sister. She is wonderful. She is an incredible part of this church, and we absolutely love having her here. And you should have seen both of them light up. I mean, it's as simple as that. Where sin would use the members of our body, our faculties, our mouth, our ears, and so on, use it for unrighteousness. God can redeem that. And the fact is, God has redeemed that. I just have to live that way. I actually do. At one time, I was a slave to sin. Now I am not a slave to sin. I don't have to talk that way. I can talk in godliness. I can build people up. I can be an encourager. I can help people. I can serve people because God has changed me. And friend, if you are in Christ, you consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Refuse to let sin rule over you and resolve to surrender your body and your mind in obedience to God. Those are the things that you have to do. It tells me that God wants to do good things through us. God wants to use us. God wants to use us as his weapons for righteousness, as his tools for comfort, as his ministers of grace. Later on, Paul is going to say that we are, in fact, ministers of reconciliation. That's what God has made us. He's brought us from darkness to light, and he has made us his ambassadors. What an incredible thing. What an incredible transition from being a people who were condemned by our sin, who were dead and who had inherited the wrath of God. Now we are ministers of reconciliation. Now we are tools of righteousness for God. Do you know what I have to do? I have to resolve on a daily basis that I will yield my members, my body, and my mental faculties, I will yield my members to God for righteousness. These are practical things that God expects from us on a daily basis. Now, you notice the way that those three commands are phrased. And I, I, I phrase them that way so as to reflect the truth of the passage, which is what we should always do. You must, you must, you must. Well, verse 14 is not you must. Verse 14 is you can. You can. It's one thing for somebody to say, you got to do this. You got to do this. You must do this. It's another thing to know that you have the ability to do that. If I were to say you must run a four minute mile, I know that nobody in here has that ability. So that's a command without effect. Effect. 
That's a command that I have no business, no reasonable business expecting anybody to fulfill. But if God says, you must, you must, you must, then he says, you can do this. That tells me that there is a reasonable expectation for those in Christ to obey these commands on a daily basis. And look at how Paul does this. Verse 14, he says, For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Because you can do this. For sin will not, it's the word there, dominion, will have no dominion. It's the same word there where we get Jesus' title, Lord, kurios. For sin will not be Lord over your life. What that tells me is this, though I must regard myself dead to sin, alive to God, though I must refuse to allow myself to be ruled by sin, though I must resolve to surrender my body and my mind to obedience in God, I can do these things. Sin will not be Lord over me. Write down this fourth truth, and this is the foundation upon which your obedience is made possible. You can live in victory over sin because of the grace you have received. Look at how Paul says this. For sin will have no dominion. It won't be Lord over your life. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law. Now that seems to be a bit of a confusing statement because we, we don't we don't readily understand what that means. For you are not under the law. That doesn't mean that you're not required to obey the moral commands of God. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is drawing a contrast here. Again, he uses that emphatic adversative particle, but under grace. It says, for you are not under the law. What does Paul mean by, by a person being under the law? What did he explain to us in those first three chapters? What does the law do for us? The law demonstrates to us the holiness of God. The law demonstrates to us the holy standard of God. And the law demonstrates to us that we are unholy in the eyes of the law. That's what the law does for us. And when we are under the law, what is the verdict? Guilty. He says, you're not under the law. You are under grace. Paul is using that word grace to encapsulate everything that he has said about justification. You are under grace. By faith in Christ, you have access. Doesn't he say that in chapter 6? You have access now into the grace in which you stand. You now stand perpetually, permanently in a position of grace. You are in a permanent state of favor with God. You are in a permanent state of power over sin. Sin won't have dominion over you anymore. You're not under that anymore. You have been redeemed. You have been restored. You have been renewed. You have been regenerated. You are a different person. You are one under grace. And that's why sin will not have lordship over you unless you subject yourself to it. Sin will not have lordship over you unless you subject yourself to that. Remember that thought with me. Remember that truth with me. That the only way sin will rule over you is if you choose to elect it to that position. But you don't have to put your vote there. If you have already cast your vote on Christ, if you have already received Christ by faith, sin will not have dominion over you. You have victory over sin. So then you can consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Therefore, you can refuse to let sin rule over you. And you can resolve on a daily basis to use your mind, your mental faculties, and your physical members in ways that are honoring and glorifying to God. I love that God does not put a standard on me now that I am unable to fulfill. 
The standard that I was under, the standard that you were under when we were under the law, that was a standard we could not fulfill because of the weakness of our bodies, because of the weakness of our flesh, because of the sin nature we inherited from our forefather, Adam. But guess what? We're not in Adam anymore. We are in Christ now. So sin will not have dominion over us. Now God has given us a standard that we can live by and the ability to achieve that. Friend, you must live like you are alive in Christ. Now the invitation is very simple here. Let, let's talk to believers real quick. To some, of our, to some believers here at various times of our lives, we, we mess up, we fall down, we slip up. And we surrender ourselves to unrighteousness. We yield our members, our mental faculties to do ungodly things. So this morning, as we, as we respond here, honestly, Seth is going to be up here and he's going to lead us in a song. But as we have a time of response here, this is what I want to invite you to do. If you are a believer in Jesus, I want you to, to think over, and maybe the Holy Spirit has already spurred you on to think on things where you have surrendered your mental faculties, your mouth, your ears, your eyes, your body, where you have surrendered yourself as instruments of unrighteousness. And I want, while, while Brother Seth sings, I'm not going to ask anybody else to sing, while, while Brother Seth sings, I just want all of our believers, if you would, in just a moment, just bow your head. I'm just going to ask you, just, just ask the Lord. Say, Lord, would you forgive me for where I have used the body you gave me? I've used the mind that you gave me, the wit, the intellect. I've used those things as members of unrighteousness. But Lord, this morning, right now, I yield myself wholly to you. Lord, would you use me to accomplish the good things that you've set before me? Lord, you've given me the ability. Help me to believe that and help me to live that. Now, for those who say, you know what? I just don't have the ability to not sin. I don't have the ability to overcome temptation. You've got another problem entirely. And the problem is simply this. You don't have the ability because you are a slave to sin. And you are a slave to sin because you have never been set free by Christ. But if by faith you put your trust in Jesus and say, Lord, I believe that you came for me. I believe you're the son of God and you lived a sinless life. You died a sacrificial death that my sins deserve and you're raised up from the dead. Lord, I believe in you. And this morning I want to be united with you in death to sin. And in resurrection to new life. Friend, I would ask that you would do that. If you cannot have victory over sin, you can have it today if you put your faith in Jesus. If you are in Christ, you got to live like it. Would you pray with me?